starting from Ushuaia, the most southerly city in the world, our voyage will take us to some of the most remote and isolated islands anywhere on Earth. Right the way up the middle of the Atlantic, covering a huge distance, 7,500 nautical miles. In an age where we race around the world in jets, it's a nice way to travel at a much more human scale, watching the world go by and really getting a, a sense for how big the ocean is. Along the way, we're going to see incredible contrasts from the fringes of the Antarctic, where we expect snow and ice, right the way up into the tropics and across the equator, where the deck will almost be too hot to walk on. This morning, we're exploring Carcass Island in the West Falklands. This is our first stop in the Falkland Islands, and it's a great stop for wildlife, especially for birds. Carcass Island is an island that has remained free of mammalian predators such as rats and cats which have typically arrived when people arrive in these islands. There's a great diversity of birds here on Carcass. We can see steamer ducks, we can see upland geese, there's oyster catchers along the, along the shoreline, there's rock shags, black crowned night herons. It's really quite remarkable how many species we can see in a very small area. Here on West Point this afternoon We've travelled across the island and visited a colony of rockhopper penguins and black-browed albatross nesting on the cliffs above the raging South Atlantic Ocean this afternoon. Some very windy exposed sites, but these are the sites that the albatross just love. It makes for great flying for them, for easy landing and for takeoff. The rockhopper penguins tucked in among the albatross nests are just beginning their molt at this time of year. They finish breeding, they'll come ashore, they'll spend two or three weeks standing in one place undergoing a catastrophic molt. So our, our landfall here in South Georgia is Right Whale Bay, a small bay uh, protected from the wind, believe it or not. This is a normal South Georgia day with the wind whistling down, uh, down the valley behind the beach. And uh, we're, we're here to see the king penguins. A relatively small colony of king penguins, believe it or not. Only about 4,000 pairs, but it still feels quite large as you see the, the colony stretching away up the hillside. I think it's just overwhelmingly magnificent. I've never seen anything like it. I love it. The color and the action is just marvelous. <laughs> well, it's a place, South Georgia's a place I've been eager to see for 37 years since I read Alistair Hardy's Great Waters. And our first landing is certainly not disappointing. Spectacular terrain. Just highlighted the perfect dusting of snow, some of which we got while we were ashore. This fabulous colony of kings, uh, and you know the never dull antics of all the fur seals. It's beyond spectacular. This is the most amazing place I've ever been in my entire life. I've never seen anything like it, and even though I've seen photos of this place, until you're actually standing right here among these guys, it's. He had no, I had no concept. We're here at Salisbury Plain on South Georgia. And this place has everything that South Georgia has to offer. We have scenery, mountains, we have glaciers, we have the ocean, icebergs. And then we have 100,000 king penguins. The great thing about being in a humongous colony like this is that you've got the classic wide open vistas of penguins gathered to do their courtship, their mating, their breeding, their feeding, their taking care of chicks. Each section of a king penguin rookery or colony has different behaviors going on. You've got groups that are taking care of their eggs, they're incubating their eggs. You've got birds that are feeding their small chicks that have just hatched. You've got mid-sized oakum boys that are old enough to stand away from the parents on their own. And you've got the big, fully-fledged oakum boys that are ready to go to sea.
during our visit to South Georgia, we've been lucky enough to be here at the right time of year to see these normally pelagic animals. The southern elephant seal spends 80 to 90 percent of its lifetime out at sea in the open water. They come ashore for only two periods of time each year, for the molt and for the breeding season. The breeding season will have taken place earlier in the year, and now these two males behind me are going through their molt. They're they're displaying what's known as a thigmotactic behavior. They're lying next to one another, because not because they like each other's company. In fact, if you watch them closely, you'll see them get fairly grumpy with one another. But the reason being is because the heat generated from the extra friction of them lying together speeds up the molting process and expedites the whole procedure so they can get back out in the open ocean faster. We landed today at Fortuna, and one of the guests and Kathy happened upon another fur seal that had something wrapped around its neck. In this case, this bit of green nylon rope that had gone around its neck at some point when it was younger and was starting to cut into the skin. Now, like the first seal that Patrick and Lisa and Tim rescued at Strong Nest the other day, we were able to wrestle this one to the ground and Kathy cut it loose while we hold it down. Ready? Ready. If this stays on the animal, within a few months time or a year or so, it starts to cut through the skin and into the animal's flesh, causing a massive infection and of course uh, severely hampering its chances to survive as it grows older. It's nice when we come to a place like South Georgia that we love so much that occasionally we get a chance to give something back and help the animals that we enjoy visiting. We have arrived in Tristan da Cunha, and we've all managed to land here, which is no mean feat. The most remote island community in the world, situated somewhere midway between South America and Africa. Uh, we're actually closer to New York than we are to London at this point. And there is a lively community here who we're about to meet. They've been here on almost continuous settlements since 1816 when this island was garrisoned because Napoleon was put on St. Helena to the north. And the same family, some seven or eight families and their descendants, still live here on Tristan da Cunha. We've had a great landing here on Nightingale Island this afternoon. It's just across the water from Tristan, but we've managed to find a lot more wildlife here than we did on the main island of Tristan da Cunha this morning. And there's land birds here. There's the Tristan thrush and the Tristan bunting. Both very approachable, easy to see, and they're both endemic to this archipelago. That is to say they're found here, nowhere else in the world. There's a lot of rockhopper penguins nesting here different subspecies to the one that we saw in the Falkland Islands. 